Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. Season 3, Episode 4, the one about capital punishment. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I'll prove it to you. This week's episode is all about capital punishment. You might know it as the death penalty, but it's where the punishment for committing a crime is death. It's currently not used for any reason in Britain, but there are people who think it should be brought back in certain circumstances. But what are the reasons for this and what are the arguments against the death penalty? Let's dive in. Now, if we look at human history from the perspective of the Abrahamic faiths, so I'm talking Christianity, Islam and Judaism, because they all came from a man called Abraham. Then the death penalty was recorded in the story of Adam and Eve, who disobeyed God and ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the punishment was death. Now, the death penalty has been part of human legal history for at least 4,000 years. The first record of the death penalty is during the Babylonian times, when King Hammurabi gave the death sentence for 25 different offences. Throughout Roman and Greek history, the death penalty was used liberally, and obviously, Jesus was sentenced to death by crucifixion by the Romans. In Britain, the death penalty was prevalent from around Anglo-Saxon times up until the 20th century. In the 10th century, so we're talking just over a thousand years ago, hanging was our preferred method of execution. In the 11th century, William the Conqueror banned the death penalty and less in times of war. But 500 years later, in the 16th century, 72,000 people were executed under the reign of Henry VIII. You might have heard of him. A variety of methods were used, hung, drawn and quartered, burnt at the stake, beheaded, boiled, for a variety of offences including treason, not admitting to a crime or marrying a Jew. From then on, there was an increasing hunger for capital punishment for an increasing number of crimes, 222 different crimes at one point, including cutting down a tree and stealing rabbits. Capital punishment for murder was abolished in Britain in 1969 and banned for all crimes, including treason, in 1998, although no executions actually took place in Britain after 1969. There's a great film called Let Him Have It about the controversial story of Derek Bentley, who was hung for murder. He was posthumously pardoned in 1993 and the conviction was reversed in 1998. I'll come back to this story later. Currently, 108 countries have totally abolished the death penalty for all crimes. But 60% of the countries of the world still have some form of death penalty, including China, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Japan, and Taiwan. In the US, it depends on the state. So 22 states have abolished it completely, 28 still have it in some form. Since 1976, there has been 1,527 executions in America. Most of these have been convicted at a state level, but from 2019, Donald Trump ordered executions for the first time in 20 years, including a lady called Lisa Montgomery, who was the first female to receive the death penalty in 70 years. Her story sparked controversy due to the complex mental health issues of Montgomery. I'll return to this story later as well. In the US, the current preferred method of execution is the lethal injection. This is because it is seen as the most humane method. The preferred procedure is as follows. Two sterilized intravenous needles are inserted into the person to be executed, one in each arm. The second one is a backup in case the first one fails. Then three separate chemicals are administered. The first one is a barbiturate to make the person unconscious within 30 seconds, which would also eventually cause death by lack of breathing. The second one is a muscle relaxant to cause complete fast paralysis and again would eventually cause cardiac arrest. Last of all is a potassium chloride solution, a potassium salt, which increases the blood and cardiac concentration of potassium to stop the heart via an abnormal heartbeat and cause death by cardiac arrest. So this is believed to be the most humane way to execute a human. 
But some botched lethal injections are making people question this. Under the Trump administration, they used a compound barbiturate rather than three separate drugs. And there's some speculation that this was not designed or not knowingly designed for humans. And it's also argued that it is more likely to result in a slow, painful death than if it was in three parts. So let's look at the arguments for the death penalty. Before we do that, we do have to know the aims of punishment. What are we actually trying to achieve when we punish somebody? Well, there are four main aims of punishment. protection deterrent, retaliation, and rehabilitation. So first of all, let's look at protection. Protection means that the punishment protects individuals or society from the criminal. Prison is an example of a method of punishment which meets this aim of protection. As if a criminal is in prison, they can't commit crimes. Deterrent means that a punishment puts people off committing crimes in the first place. The death penalty is thought to meet this aim, that the threat of your own death will deter you from committing a crime. Third is retaliation. So the aim of retaliation is to give people what they deserve. So someone who kills someone deserves to have their life taken. Finally is rehabilitation. So the aim of this punishment is to make the criminal learn the error of their ways and not commit crimes again. For example, community service is designed to make the criminal feel a useful member of society so that they don't want to commit crimes against it. Knowing these aims of punishment will help us to consider arguments for and against the death penalty. So let's first look at arguments for bringing the death penalty back. The first argument is that it acts as a deterrent. This means that people will be put off committing crimes that have a death penalty attached to it. The problem with this is that it doesn't seem to be supported with evidence. In fact, in the US, states with the death penalty seem to have higher rates of crimes that are punishable by the death penalty. Now, there could be many reasons for this. Firstly, if you are about to commit a crime of passion, then it's unlikely that you're going to be thinking rationally about the consequences. But also, it is sometimes argued that killing becomes an accepted method of dealing with problems in the minds of those living in the states. Almost as if people think that, well, if the state are doing it, it must be okay, so we'll do it. The second argument for the death penalty is about retribution. Many people believe that if someone has taken a life, they don't deserve to have a life. So therefore, ending the criminal's life is the only true form of justice. I kind of think this seems to be our default setting. As a teacher and a mum, I have to tell children off for fighting or arguing, and I often hear, but they hit me first. It seems to be instinctive to want to do back what someone has done to you. It's as if we think that if we do it back, that person will know what it feels like, so won't do it again. I also think that sometimes people feel better knowing that whoever took the life of their loved one isn't allowed to live. However, I am not sure anything takes away the pain of losing someone. Also, killing the perpetrator is going to punish their family who are often innocent. And thirdly, if you kill the wrong person, the injustice cannot be undone. Earlier, I mentioned Derek Bentley. He was executed because when the police turned up at their armed robbery and demanded they put their weapons down, Bentley told his brother to let him have it. The prosecutor argued that he was telling his brother to let the police officer have it, i.e. have a bullet in his brain. However, the defence claimed that he was telling his brother to let the police officer have his gun, i.e. to surrender. The fact that he was posthumously pardoned is of some comfort to those who have fought for his innocence, but you can't undo execution. And the reality is, innocent people are killed. The third argument in support of capital punishment is financial. Why spend thousands of pounds keeping someone in prison when you could just execute them? It costs £45,000 a year per prisoner in the UK. That money could be better spent on improving policing or on education or healthcare. However, it is actually a fallacy that capital punishment is cheaper than prison. A fallacy is a mistake or a falsehood. An independent study in Kansas estimated that the cost of a death penalty case was 70% more than the cost of a comparable non-death penalty case. Death penalty cases cost on average $1.26 million, whereas a non-death penalty costs on average $740,000. In Tennessee, death penalty trials cost an average of 48% more than the average cost of trials in which prosecutors seek life imprisonment. 
In Maryland, death penalty cases cost three times more than non-death penalty cases, or $3 million for a single case. In California, the current system costs $137 million per year. It would cost $11.5 million for a system without the death penalty. The reason why this is the case is because death penalty trials cost far more than non-death penalty trials, as they have to spend more time checking evidence and making decisions. Also, the convict is often kept in prison and, due to the nature of their crimes, have to be in their own cell and be guarded 24-7. Then there is the cost of the appeals, much more prevalent in a capital punishment case, plus you've got the cost of the execution itself. It costs around $50,000 to keep an inmate in prison per year in the US, but $175,000 a year to keep a death row convict in prison in the US. And convicts on death row are often kept there for an average of 20 years. The final argument for the death penalty is protection. Simply, if someone is dead, they cannot kill anyone else, so society is safer. Of itself, this is a valid argument. However, if we look at the bigger picture, we have already seen that states with the death penalty consistently have higher rates of murder than those without it. So while the state is safe from that one person who has been executed, they are actually less safe than other states overall because there are simply more murderers. It's almost as if the more murderers you kill, the more there are. Furthermore, look at the statistics of who ends up in prison or on death row. African Americans make up 6.5% of the American population, but 40.2% of the prison population. While a white male has a 1 in 17 chance of ending up behind bars, for black males, it is 1 in 3. There are two possible reasons for this. Number one, that black men are more likely to commit crimes. Or number two, that black men are more likely to be arrested and prosecuted for a crime. There is simply no scientific or genetic reason why the colour of someone's skin will affect their likelihood of committing a crime. So either the justice system is inherently racist, or society is, or both. Watch the documentary 13th on Netflix to find out more about this. It's called 13th because the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, but only if that person is free. If they are in prison, then they are allowed to be slaves. It therefore makes financial sense to have as many people in prison as possible, and you can begin to see the connection to race. So what are the arguments against the death penalty? Well, number one, as we have said, if the wrong person is convicted, then justice cannot be served. You cannot be brought back from the dead if a mistake is made. Number two, it doesn't work. States with the death penalty have higher murder rates. Number three, it is more expensive than other forms of punishment. Number four, if you have a law that you shouldn't kill people, then everyone should have to follow that rule, even the government or the state. Number five, there are botched lethal injections, so convicts do not die in a humane way. Number six, it is against our human rights. Everyone has a right to life. Number seven, it is racist. More African Americans are on death row in the US than white Americans. Number eight, it punishes the family of the convict who are innocent. Watch the film Dead Man Walking because it explores this brilliantly. And lastly, as with the case with Lisa Montgomery, the first female to receive the death penalty in 70 years, it often overlooks the mental health of the convict. As a child, Montgomery was left in a house with her family and was subjected to extreme physical, psychological and sexual abuse, while our half-sister was removed and taken to a loving foster home. Montgomery ended up with bipolar disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, disassociative disorder and traumatic brain injury as a result of her abuse. Many people testified that she did not deserve the death penalty, but did deserve mercy and support for her mental health as a recognition of failings by the state to prevent the abuse she experienced. There is a reason why children under 12 are not culpable, i.e. they don't have to go to prison if they break the law, and it's because they can't fully understand what they are doing. Should this extend to severe mental health cases too? So let's look at the religious responses to this issue. Well, in Christianity and Judaism, there is a verse that says, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth which suggests that what you do to others should be done to you. So if you take a life, yours should be taken. Especially as the Ten Commandments says, do not murder. However, this could also mean that no one should murder. 
including governments. In the New Testament, the message is about love and forgiveness. So many Christians today are against the death penalty as it is not a loving thing to do. Jesus also said that you should treat others the way you want to be treated. So therefore, should not give out the death penalty if you do not want to receive it. However, they also believe that the wages of sin is death. So if you disobey God, you will go to hell. And also think about it. The whole of Christianity is based on capital punishment. Jesus died for our sins so we could be forgiven. In Islam, the Prophet Muhammad sentenced people to death for murder. And Sharia law states that the punishment for murder, adultery and denying Islam is the death penalty. However, they also believe that forgiveness is better than the death penalty. And they believe that Allah is merciful. So if you are truly sorry, you can be forgiven. The death penalty is clearly against Buddhist and Santanam Dharma teaching. They place great emphasis on non-violence and compassion for all life. There was no specific teaching in Sikhi about the death penalty, but most Sikhs think that if it was allowed, there'd be guidance on it in the Guru Granth Sahib, so therefore are generally against it. However, the Kapan is a weapon used to defend those who need it, and the Khalsa are allowed to fight to defend people. So what's the answer? Well, what does everyone agree on? We all agree that we want our world to be safer. We all agree that we want a world where people don't murder others. Capital punishment doesn't seem to achieve that. In fact, prison doesn't achieve that. Prisons actually teach people how to be better criminals. They feel misunderstood and mistreated by the system, discriminated against by a society who won't give them a job once they've had a criminal record. They meet other criminals in prison and learn new skills or get new opportunities in crime on release. It is no wonder that we have such a high recidivism rate in the UK. Oh, scary word alert. Recidivism rate simply means rate of reoffending. Did you know that in the UK, 75% of ex-inmates reoffend within nine years of release? 39.3% reoffend within the first 12 months. And these statistics are only based on those convicted. The actual rate is almost certainly higher. So something isn't working. So what's the answer? Is there any country that has a system that works? Yes, Norway. Norway has some of the lowest recidivism rates in the world. Remember, recidivism means reoffending. 20%. So what's their system? Well, it's based on treating the criminal in the way that you want them to behave. So if you treat humans like animals and lock them up in cells, then they will behave like animals. If you treat the criminals with respect, then they will respect the system and therefore the law. So, sentences are short, except that they cannot leave the prison, no other rights are taken away, so they can still vote and therefore feel part of the system. And the focus is on rehabilitation. Jobs are found for the inmates before they are released, so they have less need to turn to crime. The prisoners and the guards eat together. Inmates have their own rooms, which are never locked. Prisoners are taught skills, given counselling. The environment is clean and bright. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of such systems is financial, and it does cost three times as much as British or American prisons per prisoner per year. However, because sentences are shorter, the recidivism rate is lower and the overall crime rate significantly lowers. And as a result, the overall cost of the prison system in Norway is less. If you want to know more, look up Holden Prison. I'll put some links in the show notes. Now, if we had a more cost-effective justice system, the UK currently spends £8.3 billion a year, could governments support mental health far more? And maybe people like Lisa Montgomery wouldn't have done the things that she'd done. What if we closed tax loopholes for the very rich? Could that increased tax revenue be spent on education and an efficient justice system and make the UK a much safer place? Now, in the end, you will all have your own opinions about justice and punishments. But my way of approaching it is this. What if it was my son or daughter or mother or best friend? How would I want them to be treated if they broke the law? How would I want to be treated if I broke the law? And it comes back to the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. I think that should extend to those who break the law too. I believe that humans are inherently good and valuable. 
but they sometimes do the wrong thing. There needs to be a consequence for breaking the law. Otherwise, there's no point having laws. But it mustn't make the situation worse. Simply, if our prison system worked, very few people would be in them. But what do you think? Do you think the death penalty should be brought back to the UK? Should we learn from Holden Prison in Norway? Or do you think what we have is the best there is? Message me on Twitter at the RE Podcast One or Instagram at the RE Podcast or email me at Louisa Jane Smith at the RE Podcast.co.uk. I would love, as ever, to hear from you. My name is Louisa Jane Smith. This has been the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I've just proved it to you. But thank you so much for letting me bore the life out of you. 